Hello, everybody. I don't have anything to start with uh, today, so we'll just get right to it. Um, I think there's various uh, questions regarding American citizens, but I guess we'll get to them later. I wanted to ask first about this uh, um, good ISIS report, the Institute for Science and International Security, um, specifically on various changes that were made to the JCPOA by the Joint Commission. Uh, I gather you've had a chance to read it. Uh, can I just ask you one, has, has there been any loosening to the low enriched uranium stockpile rule as written down in the agreement? No. No. So 300 kilograms that's defined in the agreement remains the stockpile limit for Iran, and they have never crossed that. Uh, it does, and yes, they've never crossed that. So do you, do, you, um, do you agree with the report, and also I think there was a media report by Reuters, uh, that these amount to secret agreements that have changed the nature of the JCPOA in any way? No, we wouldn't agree with that characterization at, at all. I think, uh, as many of you know, and it's written right in the JCPOA, that, which established the Joint Commission, that the work of the Joint Commission uh, would be confidential unless the Joint Commission decided otherwise. And it's right there uh, in the JCPOA itself. Um, and that's designed that way. Do you consider, and then I'll, I'll let my colleague um, ask some follow-up questions, but um, the, the LEU that's in the system, as it were, uh, do, you not, do you not count that as part of the stockpile? Well, I, what I would tell you is that the, the, according to the JCPOA, Iran is limited to a stockpile of 300 kilograms of low enriched uh, uranium. Uh, that is usable for the making of fissile material or usable to, uh, to be able to obtain a, a nuclear weapon. And that limit hasn't changed. They've not exceeded that limit. Um, and uh, you know, beyond that, I'm, I'm just not able to get into additional detail. Why don't we step back a second and just ask, what is your broad reaction to this report? Well, we've read the report. We, uh, I've looked at it my, myself. Um, um, uh, what I can tell you is that Iran's nuclear commitments under the JCPOA have not changed. There's been no moving of the goalpost, as it were. Um, the Joint Commission has always been intended to address implementation issues when they arise. That's the whole purpose for it. Um, and as I said, uh, the, the work of the, JC, of the Joint Commission, as stipulated in the agreement itself, is to be um, confidential. Um, I also would, would assert that the Joint Commission has not and will not loosen any of the commitments um, and has not provided any exceptions that would allow Iran to retain or process material in excess of its JCPOA limits that, that it could use in a, in a breakout scenario. Um, <coughs> and as I think I answered uh, uh, in Brad's questions, the, the notion uh, which I've seen in the uh, report uh, mentioned several times the beginning, middle, and end that uh, that there was that there was some untowardness here about the uh, the confidentiality of the work of the Joint Commission is is not founded, and any suggestion to the contrary is just false. And you can read it right in the JCPOA. Putting aside whether it would require an exemption from the English language to use an alleged word like untowardness, um, the question it seems to me is if the work of the Joint Commission is uh, by definition, uh, confidential. How then is appropriate oversight over the Joint Commission ever to be exercised by the U.S. Congress or any other interested party? Well, the Congress has been fully briefed uh, on the JCPOA and um, has been, uh, and we have, um, we have maintained a regular contact with uh, members of Congress about um, the work of the Joint Commission. In other words, to put it plainly, the Joint Commission has not provided any exemptions for Iran's requirements under the JCPOA or anything that could be construed as an exemption. That's your position. Well, okay, you don't like the way I used untoward. I'm not going to quibble with you on, 
what construes or who construes what. What I can tell you is, James, as I said in the past, and I'll be happy to repeat it, the Joint Commission has not and will not loosen those commitments. There's been no loosening of the commitments that Iran is responsible for under the JCPOA, uh, and it has not provided any exceptions that would allow Iran to retain or process material in excess of its JCPOA limits that it could use in a breakout scenario. And I would just remind you, if you will allow me, that as you and I sit here today, that breakout timeline is about a year long. And before the JCPOA, we were talking about a few months. Have there been any briefings to members of Congress on the work of the, of the Joint Commission? Yes, as I said, the, uh, the, the Congress has been kept informed. You said on the we have JCPOA. No, I did not. I said both. But I'll say it again, the administration has briefed Congress frequently and comprehensively on all the Joint Commission's work. When was the last such briefing? I'd have to get a date for you. I don't know. And I would also add that um, uh, for members of Congress that uh, continue to have questions and may have questions in light of this report, we are more than happy to continue to conduct those kinds of briefings. Last one for me. The White House uh, issued a background statement to Fox News earlier today. Uh, referring to the allegations in this report that have to do with Iran's production of heavy water. And that statement noted that Iran had swiftly addressed um, its overproduction of heavy water um, uh, to the satisfaction of the IAEA. Mm -hmm. um, when was Iran not in compliance with its overproduction of heavy water? I think I addressed this back in March, and I don't know the exact date, uh, but uh, but we were very open about it at the time. Uh, uh, in fact, I know I, I was from the podium that they uh, uh, that they they had exceeded um, the uh, I think it's 130 ton limit. Uh, the IAEA caught it. Uh, and Iran corrected it, and they corrected it uh, uh, fairly expeditiously. You know, I, I don't want to play semantics with you, but I am concerned that I ask you a question of whether or not the Joint Commission has uh, enacted any exemptions for Iran or anything that a reasonable observer would, would conclude to be an exemption. And by way of answering, you talk about the loosening of commitments. And so I just wonder if you can address my question on its own terms. I'm not going to talk about the specific work of the Joint Commission, James. I'm not going to do that. And, you, and I, I can't do that because by the agreement itself, it's confidential. So I'm not going to get into that. So what but permits I, wait, you to – Now, wait a second. I, I, I understand where you're going here. I'm not going to talk about that. But what I can assure you uh, and, and everyone else is uh, that there has been no loosening of – Iran's commitments, and there have been no exceptions given that would allow them uh, to uh, exceed the limits, whether it's the limits of uh, LEU or the limits of heavy water, uh, that would allow them to have a usable, usable amount of material in excess of what they're supposed to have uh, uh, towards uh, the production of fissile material. So if you can say there's been no loosening and there's been no exceptions, what is it that prevents you from using the word exemptions. There have been no exemptions granted. The Joint Commission has provided guidance on implementing the JCPOA. That's what it's for. It's designed to do that. None of that guidance allows Iran to have more than 300 kilograms of LEU that it can use to enrich further. Um, and as the IAEA has said themselves, uh, Iran is implementing on that commitment. Do you regard David ISIS as a, a reputable figure? David Albright? Right. Excuse me, David Albright of the good ISIS. Do you regard David Albright as a as a reputable figure in this kind of analysis? I'm not going to characterize the the the, uh, the uh, Mr. Albright can speak for his own work. We certainly respect his uh, intelligence uh, and respect the position that he holds. We certainly respect the work of ISIS. This isn't about. I'm not going to get into uh, you know characterizing one way or another. Um, uh, but he's not but, some partisan foe of the Iran deal, correct? I, I don't know. You'd have to ask Mr. Albright what his views are about the Iran deal. Um, I, I, I'm not going to characterize his own uh, proclivities with respect to the deal. Kirby, I'd like to return to the um, exception exemption issue. Um, as James points out, every time he asks you about exemptions and whether or not the Joint Commission has issued any exemptions, you <clears throat> 
say there's no loosening and they did not provide any exceptions. Can you tell us, well, not can you tell us, did they provide any exemptions? What I can tell you is the work of the Joint Commission is confidential and I'm uh, not privy to it as I shouldn't be and even if I was, I wouldn't be at liberty to discuss it. What I can assure you of is the same thing I assured your colleague of, is that there's been no loosening of the commitments and Iran um, has not and will not under the JCPOA be allowed to exceed the limits that are spelled out in the JCPOA. Um, so just for the last time, you're not going to address the question of whether or not exemptions were issued? I'm not going to address the work of the Joint Commission because I cannot address the work of the Joint Commission. Second, you are, you're standing there and telling us there was no loosening, there were no exceptions made. So you are very materially discussing their work in those sentences, aren't you? I'm telling you what I'm telling you what is not happening, which is Iran is not being permitted under the JCPOA to exceed it, James. Look, I understand, I understand the wordplay here too, okay? And I get what you're trying to do, but I'm not going to speak for the work of the Joint Commission and what and, and, and the, the deliberations uh, that they have, have worked through in order well, to make sure that they are properly supervising Iran and the JCPOA. But you, you expose yourself to this, John, because by telling us what is not happening, and here's X and Y is not happening with the work of the Joint Commission, and then declining to do so on the specific question we keep asking you, in essence, you appear to be confirming that that is what is being done. I don't think I'm exposing myself, James. I think I'm trying to do the best I can to answer your questions. And I think, again, if I might, what's important here for people to remember uh, is that Iran is meeting its commitments under the JCPOA. Iran, under this deal, cannot possess a nuclear weapon, cannot threaten its neighbors with nuclear bombs. And the breakout, as you and I talk here, is one year. Before this deal, it was a few months. Before this deal, Iran had 12,000 kilograms of low enriched uranium. Now they have less than 300. That's the most important fact to remember about all this, not whether or not I'm going to go into detail and in describing for you and getting into a de definition of exceptions versus exemptions. I'm just trying to get you to be consistent in your practices from the podium, John. I'm just trying to get you to be consistent in your practices. I appreciate all the help I can. One, and one, my mom also one, gives me great one, advice every day. I'm telling you everything I can tell you, and I am not able John, to go into the work of the Joint Commission. I'd like to go back to the issue of the 300 kilograms of low enriched uranium. The JCPOA in point seven explicitly states that <coughs> Iran, quote, will keep its uranium stockpile under 300 kilograms of up to 3.67% enriched uranium hexafluoride or the equivalent in other chemical forms. The Albright report says that one of the exemptions that it says was in effect on implementation day allowed Iran to have more than 300 kilograms of low enriched uranium in the following forms, low level solid waste, low level liquid waste, I've seen sludge the waste. I've seen the report. Actually. Do you, can you state unequivocally that Iran never had more than 300 kilograms of LEU in uranium hexafluoride or any other chemical forms, including the three that I, I just named. What I said, uh, st I'll say it again. Uh, 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 Iran is allowed under the JCOPA to have no more than 300 kilograms of LEU in its stockpile, material that it could enrich further if it were not for the JCPOA. And they are not above that limit, uh, and they have not exceeded that limit of 300 kilograms of usable LEU, which can be used to enrich uh, further. They have not exceeded that limit. The, what the agreement says, and I just read it, it doesn't say usable. The word usable ain't in there. It's 0.7. It's explicit in the agreement. It's in black and white, and it doesn't say usable. It says, will keep its uranium stockpile under 300 kilograms of up to 3.67 enriched uranium hexafluoride UF6 or the equivalent in other chemical forms. It, no word usable in there. So that's the question. Did it I ever go above question, it? Arshad. You Iran, said usable. You didn't say you, that which, which caveats it. It's quite possible they can go above 300 if it's not in usable form. 
Iran has not exceeded its stockpile limit of 300 kilograms of LAU. Thank you. In any form. Do you want me to put the punctuation point on the end of that? I did. Oh, you did. Okay. You asked if I did. And I told so, you that, did. so that's in any form, including those forms that Arshad spelled yes, out. Yes, I've answered this that, question. I've answered the question. Well, they have not exceeded the stockpile limit set, stipulated under the JCPOA of 300 kilograms of, of LEU. And just in any the form. As, as I answered listed. the question. When well, you say the JCPOA, you mean the original text of it, not anything that's been adumbrated or modified later, correct? I don't know that there's been any modifications later. The Joint Commission's work goes on as uh, supervisory in terms of ensuring implementation, but the text hasn't changed. The guidance that you referenced the Joint Commission providing on implementation, is that guidance conceivably of a nature that could be decisive in how the deal gets implemented in one respect or another? Could I mean, it conceivably change the actual understanding of the, the original deal? The Joint Commission's deal? job is not to change the text of the agreement. You can't, you can't do that. It is designed to regularly consult and provide guidance on implementation, but it can't change, it does not change uh, the agreement itself. You know for you, you know, for example, I, I don't know if you can actually. I'm, right. I'm not Go sure. Go ahead. But, okay, I just want to, just to clarify. You said that Iran has not exceeded um, its limits on the JMPOA, but at, are you saying at, at at no time have they exceeded it, or you're saying that they're not exceeding it currently? No, I, I think Brad asked this. Uh, uh, since implementation day, they have not exceeded the 300 kilogram limit of LEU. Now, as I said, we did note and we were open about the fact that for a short period of time they exceeded the quantity of heavy water that they were allowed to have uh, and they corrected that. The IAEA caught it, addressed it with them and they, and they got it back to uh, within limits. But as far as LEU is concerned, since implementation day, they have been in compliance. This uh, term you're using about usable for fissile uh, material creation, uh, what substances, do you, do you have like a codification of what forms are usable? Is this agree, this was not agreed to in the JCPOA. Where, where is this determination being made? I'm not a, a nuclear expert, Brad. Uh, well, you uh, said it, not me. I mean, so. I know I said it. So where is it coming from? It doesn't make me an expert on nuclear energy. There are obviously forms uh, of, of the material that are, uh, uh, cannot be uh, further enriched and made into fissile material for a bomb. That's, as I understand it, that's a fact. And the U.S. and Iran are in agreement on these as well as the entire P5 plus 1? I believe that this makes it very clear that the P5 plus 1 is in agreement on uh, on all the all the commitments that Iran must make. On the form, because you're using this term that's not in the document. I'm just trying to figure out how we can actually check that or understand what it means. Um, if you say some things are usable but some things aren't, but I don't know which are which, you don't. You, you're supposed to. That's not spelled out in the document. That I, seems to be I, a, a new idea here. It's not a new idea. I don't look. I don't. Okay, know. then show me I where it is. Brad, if it's Brad, not a new. Brad, no, I'm not going to go through this with you in, in, at the press conference here on you know, chapter and verse in here. You don't have to. The here point it is. is. The point is that there is a limit of 300 kilograms of low enriched uranium uh, that can be further enriched for fissile material to produce a nuclear bomb. That's the limit that they're allowed to possess. Well, that's they, what, are, they are, they are, they are, they have the limit. not. He just read it out. They have. It doesn't say that. You've just changed it again. It does not say that in the agreement. This, this sentence you just said does not exist in the JCPOA. You've just invented it. I, I, I don't know how to address it any further, Brad. Oh. Think for about the, it for the it. joint commission. No, I'm not going to think about it, Brad. I've well, answered well, the question as best as I can. For the joint commission to issue its guidance, do the uh, various members of that commission have to agree unanimously on that guidance? The uh, the work of the joint commission is very collaborative, um, and the deliberations are um, obviously shared with all the members. And it is a uh, uh, their oversight duties. Um, are done as uh, acts of consensus. I mean, they, they deliberate and talk and come to conclusions uh, amongst themselves. My concern about the guidance, if I can make a rough analogy, is that no judge here in the United States 
after the fact can change the text of a law that is brought before the judge for interpretation. But the way the judge interprets the law can have a very significant impact on how that law is administered, correct? I, I don't know. I defer to your superior knowledge of the law. And so perhaps the Joint Commission can't change the text of the agreement, but the guidance they issue can potentially have a very serious impact on how the implementation is actually administered, correct? It's a complicated agreement. I think it would be it would have been foolhardy to not set up a process by which the, the P5 plus 1 could implement this very complicated agreement. Um, uh, there's a lot of good sense in having a commission to, to supervise and provide guidance on implementation, but it doesn't change the fact that they can't change the agreement itself and, 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 the, and, the, and the, 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 the tenets of it. John, just a big picture kind of question on this. I mean, part of the criticism here is that perhaps you feel as if Iran has, you know, adhered to the spirit of the agreement, but the question is, are they adhering to the letter of the agreement, you know, in all its points, and that, you know, some critics are charging that, you know, e even if you feel that they're, you know, adhering, that it's enough for them to adhere to the spirit of the agreement, and you're willing to cut them some slack on a few kilometers here or a few kilometers there to make sure that they're, you know, adhering in general to the agreement. There's been no cutting of slack, uh, Elise, and the IAEA has uh, has certified. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm aware of at least once, probably more than once, that our, Iran has been in full compliance of their JCPOA commitments. I don't believe they refer to it as the spirit of their commitments. They talk very explicitly about Iran being in compliance with its commitments, and the Secretary himself ha has certified that to the Congress. So this issue of what exactly constitutes, you know, the low enriched uranium that is um, that they're not allowed to that they're only allowed to keep up to 300 kilograms of is kind of important because there have been you know through this process of of, um, of negotiating this deal there was there was there were these issues of Iran being able to change uh, you know to convert this material to other material to other forms but that that conversion process can be can be reversed so you know when you when you um, I guess caveat or describe it as saying, you know, the 300 kilograms of material that can be further enriched. It, I think we're all trying to understand whether there's other forms of LEU that they can, of low enriched uranium, that they can keep in some other kind of form um, that, that would be allowed. I'm simply not enough of a nuclear power en energy expert to uh, address that specific question. Um, what I can tell you is that the, the JCPOA has set the limit for low enriched uranium to 300 kilograms, and that since implementation day, Iran has been in compliance uh, with, re, uh, with holding to that limit. Um, uh, and as I said, before the deal they had 12,000, now they've got less than 300. Um, they went from having a few months breakout time to a bomb to now having about a year. Um, and, and, and oh, by the way, oh, by the way, and this is something that we're, I think, forgetting, that, that as a result of this, there is now in place the most stringent strident inspection regimen uh, ever put in place in, in a deal such as this uh, on a, a nation that has nuclear power capabilities. Uh, and the IAEA themselves uh, have said that they're comfortable with the access that they have, the information that they have to make their certifications, uh, and thus far uh, they have made clear that Iran is in compliance. Yeah. Sure. Uh, do you have, a, do you have anything on the second, please? Well, uh, I don't think we're done with this right okay. now. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Julian Borgia from The Guardian. Uh, what about these 19 extra hot cells that were bigger than the limits prescribed by the JCPOA? The, the, the significance being is that you can separate plutonium in these uh, if you line up these hot cells together. Yeah. Again, not an expert here, but uh, re regarding the hot cells and without getting into specific discussions, which I'm not able to do, 
The JCPOA specifically permits the possibility of larger hot sales, hot sales, excuse me, approved by the Joint Commission. Um, and I can quote right here from uh, the JCPOA, Iran will develop, acquire, build, or operate hot cells with dimensions beyond six cubic meters in volume and specifications set out in Annex 1 of the additional protocol only after approval by the Joint Commission. So if the Joint Commission approves larger hot sales, um, it's it's possible for them to have larger hot sales. I, I cannot speak to, as I said at the top of my answer to you, I'm not going to speak to specifics here. I can't. And on the question of the Joint uh, Commission's work being the, uh, the, what? The, the, on the question of confidentiality, can you explain the rationale for that confidentiality other than it's in the, in the agreement, in that one of the virtues of JCBOA was it was a public document? Is there a rationale why these, this inter interpretation should be confidential? I'd say, in general, diplomatic discussions are confidential in nature unless all the parties agree otherwise. One last question, maybe taking this from a different approach. Is it the position of the Department that uh, Iran can only have been judged to be in compliance by implementation day by virtue of guidance that was, in fact, issued by the Joint Commission? I, I, again, you're asking me. Uh, uh, about the deliberative discussions that I'm not privy to and I, I, I couldn't answer. Uh, what I can tell you is that since implementation day, they've been in compliance with the exception of that one uh, uh, time when uh, there was a, an excess of heavy water. All right, are we done with this? One follow up on this. Um, in, I think it was Annex 4, not Annex 1, where it describes in detail uh, how it is that the Joint Commission can permit larger hot cells if it wishes. Um, it also says that the joint, and it describes that the Joint Commission's uh, deliberations and decisions are, are confidential, but it says that they can um, be made public. Um, why uh, didn't the Joint Commission, and I'm fully acknowledging that under the agreement it has the right to keep things confidential, why not uh, make its decisions public so that the public at large and the nuclear specialist community can understand precisely what is being decided and agreed to and permitted here. Why not make those things well, public? Well, as I said, in diplomatic discussions, particularly multilateral diplomatic discussions, uh, that uh, the, they're, they're confidential in nature unless all parties uh, agree otherwise. Um, and uh, the Joint Commission continues uh, to work under the um, the the work under the practice that these will be uh, that these deliberations these discussions their work will be maintained uh, uh, confidential. And does the United States government, as a member of the Joint Commission, uh, believe that all such things should be confidential? All I'm not of its deliberations. Speak, I'm not going to speak for specific. Uh, uh, I'm not asking specific. I'm just saying, do you think their deliberations should be confidential or not? I'm not asking. We respect they, the we respect the consensus view of the Joint Commission, of which we're a member, and that consensus view thus far has been to keep their work confidential. So consensus, consensus, as you know, means unanimous. In diplomatic terms, every member of the Joint Commission has opposed making public its work. I'm not going to. I I, I don't know. You the just said to, consensus. That the, was a consensus position. The word consensus means everybody agrees to it. Does, does that – so I want to make sure you're saying something accurate here, that every member of the Joint Commission has decided it's better to keep its deliberations and decisions secret, or if you're using the word consensus in some other non-precise way. Arshad, don't insult me, and don't stand up there and try to lecture me on English, okay? Let's get beyond that. Let's be grown-ups here. In diplomatic discussions, particularly multilateral ones, as I said, uh, those discussions are confidential unless all parties agree otherwise. So the Joint Commission, and I don't know who voted for what, and frankly, it's irrelevant. The Joint Commission has decided to keep their work confidential as they are expected to do, and unless they choose otherwise, in accordance with the JCPOA. And that's where we are. And I understand that you may not appreciate that and may not like that, but that's the decision of the Joint Commission. And the information has been shared uh, and briefed to members of Congress. 
as it has been shared and briefed to members of other uh, uh, legislative bodies and other members of the P5 plus one. In classified setting, correct? As far as I know, yes. Yeah. So it's not a consensus decision. It's not a unanimous decision. Uh, you can't say it was a unanimous decision. I do not know. I, okay. I do not know. Fine. I, I can tell you that, in, again, they're confidential unless all other, uh, unless uh, uh, all parties agree otherwise. Are we off this? Yes. Changes. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, do you have something on Secretary Schedule in Delhi? He's still in Delhi. I read one news report by Al Arabiya English that he met the Egyptian president there. Did he had any other official meetings in Delhi today? Uh, I, I don't know of any. Uh, I, uh, he. Uh, uh, he uh, attended the senior staff meeting this morning by VTC, and he's made some uh, some phone calls, um, uh, but I don't have a readout of that meeting. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, about 65 House lawmakers wrote to President Obama calling on him to withdraw his request for congressional approval for more than a billion dollars in arms sale to Saudi Arabia until Congress can uh, more fully debate American military support for the Saudis. They cited increasing reports of civilian casualties in Yemen. I'm wondering if you're aware of this letter. Are you in discussions with the White House about delaying the sale? Um, and is there concerns that U.S. weapons to Saudi Arabia are increasingly being used in, in the war? I, I'm only recently aware uh, of the letter, uh, Elise, and I can't wouldn't speak to uh, congressional correspondence, certainly not that, that uh, goes uh, to the President of the United States. It's really for my colleagues at the White House to speak to. Um, what I can tell you is that um, uh, Saudi Arabia remains a key uh, uh, ally and partner in the region. Uh, the United States continues to support uh, uh, a defense, a strong defense and security relationship with Saudi Arabia. The Secretary talked about this a little bit when we were in Jeddah a week or so ago. Um, and, uh, uh, and we obviously understand uh, and share concerns by members of Congress um, about um, the damage to civilian infrastructure and to s innocent civilian lives in Yemen as a result of uh, Saudi-led coalition operations. And that is also something that the Secretary raised uh, with uh, uh, counterparts in, in Jeddah when we were there. Well, uh, but we, but we will – we will obviously respond to their concerns uh, in kind, and that means uh, responding appropriately to their correspondence. But particularly if there's a you know concern about you know civil damage to civilian infrastructure and civilian casualties, there must be also a concern that that could be being done um, in the hands of U.S. weapons. Well, again, uh, uh, the, I, I can't speak to the specifics of every tactical strike or mission that the Saudis. Uh, take and what equipment and material they're using. Obviously, we uh, uh, have a strong defense relationship with Saudi Arabia, which results in foreign military sales of, uh, of quite a bit of articles uh, of defense-related equipment. There's no question about that. Um, and there are, as you well know, there are what we call end-use agreements on these kinds of things. Uh, we, do, we, we stipulate. Um, and, and when we have concerns, we express those concerns. And we have had concerns uh, uh, with uh, the conduct of some coalition operations in Yemen, and we've not been bashful about expressing those privately or publicly. And as I said, I can assure you that the Secretary raised those concerns uh, with Saudi <coughs> leaders when we were in, were in Jeddah. But this is, you know, uh, we're, we're aware of the concerns. Actually, we share some of those concerns, uh, but I, I couldn't speak for the exact manner in which there will be or won't be any changes to the uh, defense relationship. That's something that we have to work out. So. Yes. American citizens in various trouble around the world. I'll try to go through some of them quickly. Just going to have to give me time to move around. Yes, the book that's fine. Um, firstly, uh, on these reports that uh, the Kurds have returned some uh, remains to the United States of three Americans who apparently were killed in the last two months. Um, can you confirm that and any other details? All I can say is uh, I don't have anything more additionally than what I said earlier. We we have been working to help facilitate the return of the reported remains of private U.S. citizens killed in Syria. 
We remain in close contact with local authorities, and we stand ready to provide all appropriate consular assistance. Uh, but I'm just afraid I don't have more information okay. than that at this time. And I've missed a couple of days because I was away. But so if, if there's no update on some of these from what you've already said, just tell me that. Uh, on the uh, American citizen in Turkey who was in custody, do you have an update on that? I don't. And um, I did talk about uh, that individual yesterday. Okay. And then on the individual, Mr. Hull in Venezuela. No um, update. No update, and then on the. Um, but we did address that. Uh, we can point you to the, yeah, the transcript. I'll, 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 okay, and then there was the the latest video uh, of the Coleman family. Do you yeah. have a comment on that? Um, all I can tell you is that we're still examining. Um, uh, we're, we're still examining that video, um, and I don't have uh, uh, additional information uh, on that, on that case right now. So you check. You're checking its veracity and. Yeah, I mean, we're examining it as you would expect that uh, uh, that we would. Okay. Listen, do you have anything new to say about um, uh, Sandy Pam Gillis? Her husband uh, today said, accused China of suppressing evidence that weakens its case. Um, I don't really have much in terms of an update for you. Uh, we remain deeply concerned about Miss um, Van Gillis's welfare. We uh, continue to monitor her case closely. Consular officers from the consulate there uh, have visited her on a monthly basis since she was detained back in March of last year. We have repeatedly pressed Chinese authorities to provide further details of the case and to give our consular officers full and unrestricted access to her as required by the Vienna Convention. Uh, we urge the government of China to review and consider seriously the way, uh, I'm sorry, the views expressed by the UN Working Group on arbitrary detention, including its recommendation to release Ms. Fan Gillis. Just remind me, you will not have anything else, but I got to ask. Her husband has asked for uh, President Obama to ask President Xi for her release. Um, obviously, that's a White House question, but to your knowledge, has her husband asked? the State Department or Secretary Kerry to directly seek her release? I'm not aware of any such request. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, so uh, yesterday you expressed concern for the results of the vote in Gabon. Uh, since you expressed concern, the parliament has burned down, there's been a, a thousand arrests, uh, opposition headquarters has been raided, and, and Ban Ki-moon has called for the release of political prisoners. Uh, have you got any update from the U.S. <laughs> position? And are, are U.S. citizens in Libreville uh, safe? Well, we've issued, uh, as you might expect, uh, our embassy in Libreville sent a security message uh, out today to inform U.S. citizens of the widespread violent demonstrations throughout Gabon uh, in the aftermath of the presidential election. Uh, the embassy urges Americans uh, there to remain at home and, and off the streets. I don't have any uh, information specifically about the welfare of individual Americans. We, obviously. Hmm? Have you been in touch with the government or the uh, Electoral Commission about the provisional results? Uh, I noticed in your statement yesterday you called for more transparency in polling station by polling station results. Obviously, well, you haven't received that. Any. We are certainly in touch with the government uh, of Gabon uh, in the wake of the election. And I do want to stress that we deplore the escalation of violence uh, following uh, the release uh, of those results. It's a provisional election results uh, by, by the government. We urge all parties to come together peacefully in this critical time to halt a slide towards further unrest. We call upon the security forces to respect the constitutionally guaranteed rights of all Gabonese citizens and of all residents of Gabon. The international community is watching these events closely and will consider appropriate actions going and forward. And the UN specifically asked for the release of some of the prisoners. Is that something the U.S. associates itself with yet? I, I don't have. I don't think we have a position on necessarily that. Obviously, uh, uh, we uh, don't want to see. We've been very clear. We don't want to see anybody uh, uh, illegally or unjustifiably detained. Um, uh, but I'm not familiar with this particular call, okay. uh, but clearly we would want the release of anybody who is being illegally de detained or, or, uh, or, or jailed for freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, uh, of, of being part of a political discourse. North okay. Korea? John, more on Gabon. More on Gabon. Let me stay on Gabon and then we'll come around. Go ahead. Right. Uh, does the United States agree with uh, France or and EU by um, 
calling that the results of election of all polling districts should be announced before an official winner is declared? And then will the United States ask for a recount of the ballots? So well, as I understand it, no permanent results have been declared. Uh, what was released yesterday were provisional results that still need to be certified by the Constitutional Court. Um, and as I said, I think to Dave's answer, we are encouraging the government of Gabon to release the individual polling station results. Uh, we are asking that the legal procedures for certification of the results be followed according to Gabonese law in a fair and transparent manner. But it doesn't mean that a recount will be asked. What we are asking for is that the legal procedures for certification be followed according to Gabonese law. Given the close uh, cooperation between the United States and Gabon, because it's a, um, in the effort to fight against uh, terrorism, how will this election affect the future cooperation? I, I think it's too soon to say. We're obviously closely watching this uh, uh, situation unfold. We've made our, our, our concerns known. We'll continue to do that. But I'm not going to get ahead of any decisions on bilateral cooperation one way or the other. Uh, North Korea. Thank you. Uh, two on North Korea, and I think fairly quickly. Uh, first, um, one of the world's most renowned academic experts on North Korea, Dr. Bruce Bechtol of the Arizona State University, um, has suggested that the recent ballistic missile testing by North Korea um, indicates or at least the, the weight of the evidence indicates that China may have supplied a submarine-launched ballistic missile to the DPRK. Uh, is that your understanding? James, I think you know that I am not able to speak to intelligence matters here from the podium. Nothing further on that subject? I'm afraid not. And uh, secondly, um, the uh, South Korean ambassador has given an interview to VOA in which he stated that further provocations by the North would lead the ROK to seek restrictions on North Korea's membership at the United Nations. Uh, is the United States planning to seek any restrictions on North Korea's uh, membership at the UN? I haven't seen the interview. There's comments, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of any such move or desire by the United States at this time. And last, would the provision of a submarine launch ballistic missile to North Korea violate relevant UN Security Council resolutions? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, yes, but I'm not an expert on all the uh, all the resolu all, all the resolutions. It, it certainly would seem to me to be uh, be a, a yes. Um, I mean, obviously, we've got in place pretty stringent, the most strident now in the last 20 years or so, uh, sanctions on on the North and um, uh, and the kinds of things that they are able to procure or obtain. Allow me just to say, for the record, and take the liberty of speaking for Arshad when I say that I think everyone in this room respects your intelligence and would never seek to lecture you on English or anything else. Uh, and, and that reflects not only your work in this room to date, but also your entire career as a public servant. I appreciate that. Thank you. John, can I follow up? Oh, I've already gotten you. Go, Abby. Do you have any information about U.S. citizen David Snedden, who uh, was reportedly, reportedly disappeared in 2004 in China, but there are some reports that he has since appeared in North Korea? Yeah. Um, the embassy in Beijing uh, and the consulate in, and I hope I pronounce this properly, Chengdu, uh, have been in regular ongoing contact with local authorities since uh, David Snedden was reported missing in China in August of 2004. Uh, as you know, and I've said many times, one of the highest priorities of the U.S. Uh, Department of State uh, is the welfare of U.S. citizens overseas. This includes providing all appropriate assistance uh, in welfare and whereabouts cases for U.S. Citizens, when a citizen is believed to be missing abroad, we work with local authorities who are charged with investigating disappearances within that, their country. In June of 2012, the department invoked the health and safety exception to the Privacy Act and released to the Stens all information that we had regarding his case. We continue to closely monitor this matter and we continue to raise it with Chinese authorities. I, I cannot speculate. Uh, for the, re uh, uh, the reasons of his disappearance. Uh, however, I can tell you that we have seen no verifiable evidence to indicate that Mr. Snedden was abducted by North Korean officials. Okay? Turkey. 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 Uh, a, a few questions, if I may. Earlier this okay. week... I'm going to get to you. <laughs> I can see the exasperation on your face. We will work ourselves around here. It's all right. Go ahead. Earlier this week, 
Your face, you can hold your cards pretty close. It's hard, it's hard to tell what you're thinking, James. It's hard to tell. I didn't want to say that. I can just smell the smoke. Earlier this week, U.S. CENTCOM spokesman Colonel John Thomas said there was a loose agreement between Turkish and Kurdish forces to stop fighting each other in Syria. Turkey summoned the U.S. ambassador to criticize the U.S. for making such a statement, and Turkey's EU affair affairs minister said they do not accept any compromise or a ceasefire with the Kurds. Was there or was there not an agreement? I think we've dealt with this before. That was my question we? yesterday. No, well, but yeah, the we've already kind of talked about this. In the media. Huh? So was there uh, an agreement or was there not? Uh, well, I mean, I, I don't think I can give you any better answer than I did earlier on this. Uh, first of all, I want to correct the, the, the record. Our ambassador was not summoned in over this. Um, so the press reporting on that was false, and I checked that with Ambassador Bass myself. Was there a um, call? Or I, 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 you said he was summoned in. I mean, he well, regularly that, talks. That is to what the uh, uh, what the what Turkey reported, and yeah. uh, here's what the Turkish foreign minister said. I, I don't said. want to get dealt into this. I, I'm just telling you that the reports that he got summoned were wrong. He talks to uh, his counterparts in the Turkish government pretty much every day, so I'm not going to say that he isn't on the phone with them. Um, and I, and I have no problem believing the fact that uh, Turkish officials might have expressed, as they continue to express. Uh, various concerns about the situation in Syria with Ambassador Bass, the, but the reporting that he was summoned is just wrong. Now, on the agreement, I, I, I would refer you again, as I said, to uh, our counterparts uh, in, in the Defense Department. Um, uh, I, 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 you'd have to talk to the parties about whether there was a, a, a quote-unquote agreement, and I'm not even sure I understand what you mean by uh, agreement. Uh, what, what, I, what I did say, um, and what I'll say again today is that we saw calm. Uh, we continue to see um, uh, that calm persist. That's welcome. That's good. Um, and we continue to call on uh, on everybody to focus their efforts uh, on on Daesh inside Syria. Now, Turkey is inside Syria f f uh, for a purpose, a purpose we've talked about, which is to uh, secure that stretch of border, um, which has remained a major uh, avenue uh, for foreign fighters and for material to reach Daesh inside Syria. And uh, and we are obviously supportive of that effort uh, uh, by Turkey to, to secure that stretch of border, and, and those are the conversations that we're having with them. Yeah, just, just to clarify, it was the U.S. CENTCOM spokesman who said there was so, a loose uh, agreement, right. a ceasefire agreement. You're, a you're, asking me to, you're asking me to confirm something that the Pentagon confirmed themselves on the record. I, I'm in no position to to say whether that's right or wrong. They, they should speak for their own comments, and if, if, if they're comfortable saying that on the record, then, you know, then you can take it or accept it or, no, or not. They, they speak for the U.S., and you do too. Is that, isn't that right? A lot of people <laughs> for speak the for the U.S., as I'm beginning um, to learn. Uh, actually, uh, so, so uh, to, to, uh, to your response, do you think the fact that the clashes between uh, Turkish and Kurdish forces diminished in the past few days yeah. relative to the weekend yeah. speaks to the U.S.? being right about this loose ceasefire agreement and Turkey being misleading. Being right about it in what way? That there has been a loose, I'm <laughs> quoting the U.S. and I can appreciate it. I, can, I do appreciate the effort to try to get me to confirm something that the Pentagon has already confirmed themselves on the record. I, 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 I'll let them speak to whether there was an agreement and what form it took. I, from the State Department perspective, uh, we're much less worried about uh, whether something was inked on paper or not, and much more concerned about the fact that those those clashes uh, have ceased, uh, because as we said at the time, it was doing nothing to help us focus our efforts against Daesh. So that those clashes stopped and have remained, uh, uh, there is you know there's been no uh, uh, renewal of that uh, violence between um, Turkish forces and uh, and, and Kurdish uh, uh, fighters uh, is a good thing, um, but. But it's only half of a good thing, right? The rest is we, we need everybody to continue to focus on uh, on fighting Daesh. So from the State Department perspective, there is a ceasefire in place. No, I didn't uh, – I, 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 Guyana, I didn't say that. I, I'm not uh, – I don't know what led to the uh, – what specifically led to the end of the clashes, uh, but we're glad to see that. I now, whether – and, and frankly, I'm not sure – I'm not sure how relevant it is ceasefire. whether there was – an agreement as you're couching it or, or not. Clearly, somebody agreed to stop the fighting, um, and that's a good thing. 
So I'm not walking away from the fact that th there was some meeting of the minds here to stop fighting one another. That's a good thing. And, and I'm also not saying that, you know, we were uh, just passive bystanders here. Uh, we obviously have been trying to, to uh, and we have stayed in contact and dialogue with, uh, with everybody on this. Um, and as I said yesterday, uh, uh, looking for ways to keep the channels of the communication open so that that dialogue can persist so that we don't see a renewal of those clashes. About the dialogue, do you, do you think that, that um, U.S. And, and Turkish officials, uh, leaders, understand each other well? Because it is one event that they're commenting on, and one side, side says one thing, and the other says that's not what happened. I, 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 I can't speak for the level of understanding of, uh, of another individual, much less another nation. Um, I can just tell you that uh, our focus has not changed. Um, our understanding of the uh, of concerns that uh, the Turkish government uh, has about uh, uh, terrorism and about their views of uh, 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 of fighters on the other side of the the, the border with Syria are are well known. Uh, we continue to have these discussions with them. Do we agree on everything? No, uh, but I don't know of another nation in the world where the United States agrees on every possible thing. So I mean. We're, we're going to continue to, uh, to work through these issues, and we want the focus to be on Daesh. Yeah. Move on. Could, could, I'd like to ask about um, a suggestion from David Ignatius, the Washington Post columnist, about the need for a political strategy to accompany the military strategy in fighting Daesh, particularly in Syria. And he highlighted um, two elements. One was the need to reconcile Ankara with its own Kurdish population by having negotiations between the PKK and Ankara, which KRG President Masoud Barzani has also called for. And the second part of his suggestion was a political uh, vision for S Syria. He su suggested federalism, but something that addresses Kurdish political aspirations there. S otherwise, their motive to keep on fighting against ISIS is, is limited. Do you have any comment on those two points? Uh, well, I would just say this, uh, that uh, we, we do have uh, a, a strategy, uh, we do have a, a, a political view of the future for Syria. That's why Secretary Kerry has been working so hard inside the International Syria Support Group uh, to get us to a point where the opposition and the regime can renew talks to, to work on a transitional governing structure um, for the future of Syria. We've long said, nothing's changed, that we believe in a whole unified pluralistic Syria uh, that has in place a government um, that represents the voices of all Syrians uh, and can be responsive to them and to their needs so that this civil war can end. Now, the issue of federalism is something that the Syrian people would have to, to determine. What we've said, the, the large umbrella of what we want is a, a whole unified pluralistic Syria. Would something like the Iraqi model be something the United States I'm would not, consider? That, that is for the Syrian people to determine, not the United States. Can, uh, whole pluralistic unified Syria. What country in the world do you not want to see whole pluralistic and unified? That's not a vision of anything. That just means you want a country. I mean, that's, that's nothing. A, that, that, no, I, I disagree. There's 193 countries in the world. No, you don't no. think any of them should be divided or uh, disunited or at civil war. Is that correct? Which ones do you want in civil Come war? Come on, Brad. No, Look, but, that, that's but, not, but you said I, they I had a vision. I absolutely take uh, I take real issue with your your statement that it's nothing. It's not nothing, it and is. it's not nothing to the millions of Syrians that have been suffering over it's, the last five years. It's nothing to the five hundred thousand who it's, died. It's an awful lot. Uh, uh, and it, it isn't. I, I couldn't disagree with you more. Oh. I couldn't disagree with you more. Uh, a whole unified pluralistic Syria that's not at war with itself, that doesn't have a government that's barrel bombing which, and gassing Which doesn't exist. People. It it's, doesn't it's, exist now, and that's so why we're why working does that mean so a whole hard lot? on trying to reach it. Anyway. I could, I could not disagree with you more. I, I, I absolutely uh, stridently think that that is a... Uh, that is a that bold, is, a is, bold and, and uh, progressive agenda. Okay, fine. I didn't say that. I, I said I, I don't, it, I said it, is, a, it is a vision for Syria, and I take great issue with the fact that it wouldn't be. Well, it's shared by everybody. So great. What about Kurds and some kind of lessening of the conflict there or negotiations between the PKK and Ankara? Well, look, I mean, we, uh, 
we have long called on the PKK to uh, renounce violence and, and terrorism and, and return to negotiations. I mean, we've I've said that many, many times. There's nothing changed about our position on that. So you would support a, an initiative to, for negotiations between the Turkish government we and the have, PKK? We have long said that uh, we want the PKK to renounce terrorism, stop the violent attacks uh, against innocent Turkish citizens, uh, and renew uh, talks. I mean, that we, we've been very honest about that, but they've got to stop the violence. They've got to, they got to renounce terrorism. Yeah. Change of topic. Because you supported the YPG in Syria, that's emboldened the, the Kurdish movement, and that's one of the reasons why the PKK feels it has cover to engage in You'd have to ask uh, PKK terrorists, you know, uh, whether they feel emboldened or not and why. Um, uh, they're a designated foreign terrorist organization. Yep. Just one more on the subject. No, just, I'm, just I, I, I want to move on. Go ahead. Uh, this is it different topic, but the Russians are talking about the possibility of hosting the Israeli and Palestinian leaders in October with an attempt to kind of <coughs> give a re revival of some kind to, to a peace process. How would the U.S. view that? Uh, I think the Secretary has said uh, many times um, uh, uh, that he welcomes all ideas and, and all initiatives that, uh, that can explore and hopefully get us closer to a viable two-state solution. This would be a different scenario, or one that hasn't happened so far. It would be another world power mediating um, in the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, which is something the Americans have done till now. You've always talk, you always talk about direct negotiations in an American-sponsored peace process. So the Secretary's view is that the Secretary's view that, it, that that any new idea, initiative, or option that can get us closer to a viable two-state solution is worth exploring. Yeah. One. On Afghanistan, this I have seen this news report about the Charman border, on AFPAC border, Charman Gate on AFPAC border being closed for some time, and now Pakistan has said they they are going to reopen it. How do you see this development? Uh, we've seen those reports and, uh, and those statements, and uh, of course we we welcome that. Uh, wait, let me work around and uh, come back. A Abby, did you have some? It's on Syria. Okay. Back real quick. Um, Kerry and Lavrov spoke today, and then the Russian readout says that they, uh, Lavrov urged the need of separating the Syrian opposition from terrorists. Is there any progress on that point since the two of them met? Uh, they, they did talk today, and they did uh, uh, talk about uh, Syria and, um, and the work that our two teams are doing in Geneva this week to, to try to uh, work out some of the technicalities on these proposals for a better cessation of hostilities. Um, the issue of uh, uh, marbling, if you will, uh, of, uh, opposition groups or opposition fighters that uh, that uh, co-locate themselves for whatever reason uh, with uh, groups like Nusra and, and Daesh remains a problem. It cer certainly remains an issue that uh, the Secretary and the Foreign Minister have talked about, will continue to talk about, and certainly um, uh, it, it's, uh, it's part of the context of the discussion between the two teams that are working out these technicalities. Uh, one more. Um, the UN, UN envoy and the um, UN advisor on humanitarian aid gave a press conference today. It was a fairly impassioned speech by the humanitarian advisor saying that uh, he felt that we had all failed the people of Jariah. I wondered if you had any comment on that, um, on that reflection. I, I haven't seen those comments, but uh, again, I can uh, tell you that uh, everybody continues to be extraordinarily frustrated by uh, the situation on the ground in, in Syria, um, Secretary no less among them. And that's why we're working so hard to try to get a cessation of hostilities. Um, uh, but let's be honest here. While the international community certainly continues to have obligations and commitments to try to end this war and to try to create a home for the Syrian people um, uh, that they can live in peaceably, um, it is Bashar al-Assad who is, with support from Russia and Iran, I understand that, but is he uh, who is the one killing his own people? He's the one gassing them. He's the one barrel bombing them. He's the one besieging their cities. He's the one uh, who's ordering his forces to take out medical supplies when those few humanitarian convoys can get into places like uh, Daraya or Homs uh, or even Aleppo on the rare occasion. Uh, it's Bashar al-Assad uh, who has failed. Uh, the people of Syria. Yeah, Nike. Yeah, 
can you please take a question regarding uh, North Korea? Uh, Article 25 of UN Charter said that all members uh, implementing all uh, United Nations Social, uh, Security Council resolution um, are duties of all members. Given North Korea continue to violate the resolution, um, and it's been six months after 2270 was in adopted, does the United States believe the DPRK should be kicked out of the UN, or at least there should be some restriction? I, 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 I don't mean to take that question, Nike. I, I know of no such effort by the United States. Um, these, uh, this, the, the last resolution is the most, represents the most stringent sanctions on the regime. And as I said then, I mean, I, I recognize we're six months into it, but sanctions do take time. Uh, they take time to have an effect. Um, and uh, each and every time that the North Korean regime uh, behaves provocatively, it really only galvanizes the international community that much more. So if South Korea were to present a proposal for uh, revoking DPRK membership in the UN, would the U.S. consider that positively? Uh, it's a great hypothetical question that I'm not going to entertain. Yeah. Uh, I want to follow up on a statement uh, the State Department made last month regarding uh, security trainings for uh, former Secretary Clinton. Uh, the statement was the Secretary and senior staff in office uh, of the Secretary received in-person orientation on handling of classified information uh, and then worked daily with qualified professional staff. Uh, so my question is, uh, who are the people who actually would brief uh, someone like Secretary Clinton when one of those in-person briefings happened? Um, and do you have any dates of when those briefings happened? Uh, I, I don't. Um, uh, I, I don't have the dates on, on when those briefings uh, might have happened uh, or, or if they happened. Uh, but that is, that is not an uncommon uh, practice, uh, particularly for somebody at that level. And um, uh, it's usually people that work inside the uh, administrative bureau here at, at the uh, at the State Department. So they're State Department employees that, would, that provide. Uh, do you have any more specifics? I guess I don't. I don't. Yeah. Just one question. Last week, about ten days ago, a State Department with the DOJ sent a team Turkey for extradition request to work with Turkey in Ankara. I was wondering if you have any feedback on those meetings from Ankara. They did. Um, uh, have a meeting. You know, a joint team of uh, State and Justice Department uh, employees did go uh, visit Ankara to, to talk about, to talk through the process and process issues. Um, I'm told that those were constructive meetings. I don't have a specific readout uh, for you. Um, as I said at the time, um, uh, issues of extradition uh, can can often be uh, lengthy in terms of uh, the process and how long it takes. Uh, and I just don't have an update for you. Yep. Sanctions that were issued today in relation to Ukraine, and also, did that come up in the call with Foreign Minister Lavrov? The call with Foreign Minister Lavrov was uh, about Syria. Um, I don't know. Let me see here. Okay, sanctions. The text on these pages is not great. I still I find them using my glasses, even when the font is big. Um, the U.S. Department uh, of the Treasury's Office of Foreign Assets uh, Control designated and identified a range of individuals and entities today uh, under three executive orders to maintain the integrity of the current sanctions imposed on Russia. The sanctions maintenance actions designed to check attempts to circumvent existing sanctions, strengthen sanctions implementation, and provide additional information to assist the private sector with compliance. It also demonstrates the United States' commitment to link sanctions to Russia's complete implementation of the Minsk agreements and an end to the occupation of Crimea, as well as our solidarity uh, with the European Union's decision to extend its sectoral sanctions through January 31st, uh, 2017. Uh, but any further details on this, you'd have to go to the Department of the Treasury. These are their sanctions. I'll take one more. Opening a stance. Uh, more maintenance. Can yeah. you, can you make, um, make 
sure that we get uh, updates on uh, Secretary Kerry's uh, engagements in Delhi and uh, any readouts of the meetings. Uh, we'll pass that on to the traveling team. We'll be happy to do uh, what we can. One, one final one. Um, the Secretary has gotten a little bit of criticism online for um, a comment he made the other day about uh, it was kind of an offhand comment about how it would be nice if reporters maybe didn't report as much about terrorism. I don't know if you saw. I did, I, and I addressed this uh, the other day. Uh, okay. I mean, I, I did address it. Uh, okay. I'm happy to restate it uh, the, today. Uh, uh, he was simply referring to the fact that there are often more than one purpose for uh, acts of terrorism: that the violence and destruction and uh, death and <coughs> fear itself that they can instill, but also the um, uh, the notoriety that can come with with with, uh, with the press coverage of them. Uh, the obviously, I think you all know the Secretary well enough to know that uh, how much he values the work of a strong independent press and, uh, uh, and having you ask the tough questions and cover the tough issues. I was personally greatly dismayed by, no, I wasn't, but um, I just I just didn't know it had come up. I'm but sorry. I did, I, 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 said, I said the same thing <laughs> just a few days ago. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. We can do it after, it's not a big deal.